No? Okay, great. It's a tough crowd already. Well, Lord, it's a privilege it is to open your word with all my friends, and, and I know you have a specific word for many that have showed up. Some maybe didn't want to come to church today. I get it at times, but you brought them here for a reason, and I pray, God, I just want to be your spokesperson that you would speak through by your spirit, bring the scriptures to life, and I pray for complete radical life change for your people. I wanna see every single person live out your best for their life. So if there's anything in the way, I pray you would block it, any distractions, anything that would clog the message you wanna speak and your spirit would flow and we would receive in Jesus' name, amen. Well, nothing is more debilitating depressing than financial pressure. Anybody? All my wealthy people, no, y'all, y'all, y'all are good. You ever been there? I mean, talk about stress. Not, not able to sleep. You, sometimes, you ever been, like, it's like two in the morning, and you just, you're still, you can't get to sleep because you're like, how am I gonna, like, how am I gonna pay the bills? There's, there's too much month and not enough check left. And, and I'm like constantly trying to figure out in my mind, well, now I gotta move that money there and I gotta pay this. Anybody ever been there? Like, no, three, three people, great. And, and it's like so debilitating and depressing and, and you're like, oh my, how am I gonna get out of this? Now, for some of us, it, it's, it's our fault. Some of us just lack self-control financially, if we're honest. Um, or my send it, my YOLO type people, my, my spenders, okay? <laughs> Don't point at your spouse right now, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm with you. I'm a, I'm a YOLO, send it down field, like, let's go, you know? And, and many times, the financial pressure I'm living in is, is my own fault, if I'm really honest with you. Um, how about my conservative people? I mean, you know exactly what, raise your hand real quick. All you, I love you. I wish I was you. I'm just not, you know? So that's why I have my wife, right, to keep me accountable. And so some of us, it's our own darn fault. Just look to your neighbor and say, your fault. It's your fault. The financial pressure, that's on you, man. It's on you. Um, sometimes, though, it's just, it's circumstances that are outside of your, your control, I mean, you just started the business right before the pandemic. I mean, just horrible timing. And it was completely out of your control, but nonetheless, the financial pressure continued to mount to the point where you're like, man, I don't know if I'm gonna make it another day. It's the exact story that we see here. There, there was this, this widow from Zarephath, and, and you read it last week in your daily reading. And things had gotten so bad at that time, it was a major famine. And she was so poor, this widow, husband was out of the picture, she had this one son, and things got so bad that she was gonna make her last meal, feel, feed herself and her son, and then die. That's how bad it had gotten. And God sends this crazy prophet named Elijah to meet this widow, and he goes up to her and he has the audacity to say, hey, that's fine, you're gonna make the meal, but, but make me a cake first. Can you imagine being the widow? I called her Wilma, because she didn't have a name, so I just called her Wilma. Like Fred had died from the Flintstones, Wilma, here's Wilma. Wilma. And she's like down to her last piece of bread. And the prophet, the man of God, the preacher, shows up, is like, yo, um, that's cool, but make me a cake first, please. What? No, man. What was that? You're gonna see it in the text, it's so beautiful. It's God giving an opportunity for this woman to trust God even in the most dire financial situation. What am I gonna do? Am I putting God first or putting myself first? By grace, I'm gonna just blow it. Uh, <laughs> she does it. She gives to God, which in this picture, Elijah is a picture of God, gives to him first and this miraculous provision 
happens afterward, and it said that the flour and the oil never ran dry, even in the midst of a famine. And you're like, why are you telling me all this? Because here's, here's why. God's gonna give all of us one of the most profound biblical perspectives that, that we need in a time just like now. Because we're like, interest rates, inflation, all this chaos. What's gonna happen to my retirement? What's gonna happen? I'm a young person just starting out. How's this all gonna work? Can I just tell you? You know, you know if you put God first, in your finances, let him provide miraculously. I could just walk away and if you applied that in your life, you'll see your life. Now it won't always be easy, but he'll provide everything you need. So if you're a note taker, that's where we're gonna start in priority, priority. Someone say priority. It's the very first thing that she's gonna get tested in. Now to set it up, remember now, this is a famine. (laughs) King Ahab, this evil king of Israel, Married this chick named uh, Jezebel. She was, be careful who you marry, by the way. Marries this girl. And because he leads the nation astray. God said, if you go astray, I'm gonna close up heaven. It's exactly what happens. And Elijah goes, hey, King Ahab, uh, it's not gonna rain for a handful of years on my word, so uh, it's not gonna look good. And then he dips, he like takes off, and God sends him to this brook, the brook Cherith. And he's gonna provide for him during this time period by sending ravens, the birds, to drop off bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. We're not talking about the Baltimore ravens, Lamar Jackson dropping it off, no, but there's birds. They're gonna be, they're like Jimmy John sandwiches in the the morning and in the night, and then you're gonna drink from the brook, but during the famine, the brook continues to go down. Can you imagine being Elijah, by the way? This is the craziest way for God to provide for me through birds. I'm picturing him as the water continues to go more and more shallow. God, how are you gonna provide now? And what does God say? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse eight. Let's pick it up in verse eight. First Kings 17, verse eight. Then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of Zarephath. You can circle the word for Zarephath. It actually means the refining place. Sometimes, the most painful seasons of our life, including financial pressure, are actually the best times because it's refining us and placing our faith and trust back to who we really need to trust in. God goes, okay, the brook is drying up. I'm gonna send you to Zarephath near the city of Sidon. I've instructed a widow, old Wilma, there to feed you. So what did he do? He went to Zarephath. As he arrived at the gates of the village, he saw a widow gathering sticks. And I like that. I like that the poor widow wasn't trying to just sit and eat potato chips and watch like daytime soap operas, but like she was trying to get after it, man. She's trying to make things work. By the way, all you single moms, I, I'm, I'm so grateful for y'all. I have a lot of respect for you. Yeah, we can give it up for all the single, the single moms. I have a very clear memory of my mom after my parents got divorced when I was a young kid. I remember going into her closet and she had nothing in the closet. I remember she was working full time and going to school trying to take care of my older brother and I. I remember her frying up spam and Mac, how many know about the spam deal? I'm not talking computer spam. I'm talking about like the the meat in a can for like 100 years and all of a sudden it's fine. You just fry it up, throw a little mac and cheese. That was our dinner for a while. Thank God. My mom easily could have just been, she's like, you know what? I don't don't care. Somehow I'm gonna provide for my kids. She worked her tail off, gathering sticks and asked her, would you please bring me a little water in a cup? Side note real quick, can we commit as a church to just have manners? Notice what the the prophet says. Would you please bring me a little water in a cup? Some of you guys are gonna go out to brunch after. And can can we, we're gonna just, here's a little coaching lesson. When the server comes up to you, 
Instead of like, yeah, give me that uh, number three. No onions. Let's, let's, just change, let's just change it. Ready? Here it is. Oh, man, thanks for serving us today. We, uh, can you please grab me the, the number three? And even like the high maintenance order people like me, like, um, could you please bring me the, you know, the omelet, uh, number three omelet, and let's go crispy hash browns and crisp bacon, and no onions on that, please. It, isn't it crazy, though, like, how, what, that changes. Can I just tell you, that changes. Simple things, please and thank you. And when your server serves you, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. That really is a blessing. You have a good vibe. Thanks for your vibe. Because there's a world that looks at Christians as the most cheap people in the world and all judgmental. What if we change that? Sorry, another Bible study, my bad. So use please and thank you. Verse 11, as she was going to get it, he called to her, hey, could you bring me a bite of bread too? Hold on now, now you're getting over, <laughs> overboard, Elijah. She said, look at what she says. I swear by the Lord your God, I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. I have only. It's interesting. She says, I don't have. You see that lack? I don't have. I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal. That's how desperate she got. And then my son and I will die. Now, we were eating Spam and macaroni, but we weren't gonna die. That's how desperate she got. Talk about financial pressure. Talk about overwhelmed. And, and, the, and the preacher has the audacity to say, Bring me something first. Let me, just, let me just say this real quick. Please hear me. God doesn't need your money. Love Church doesn't need your money. What God is doing in this case right here, he, he is showing this poor widow how God can show up miraculously if she'll take a step of trust and give to God first. And so she, just like all of us in here, we have the opportunity. What am I gonna do with everything that God's entrusted to me? Are we gonna make him a priority in our life and trust him in this area? Every one of us, free will. So look at the very next verse. It's exactly what he says. Elijah said to her, hey, don't be afraid. Easy for you to say. Don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me. What does it say? First. Make a little bread for me first. Don't be afraid. Let me ask you this. Speaking of priority, I'm asking myself this lately. I feel like God's asking me this. What is your priority right now? Genuinely, when it comes to your time, when it comes to the treasure, God, what he's gifted you resource-wise, and your talent, what he's given you. Like, what is my priority in life? What comes number one? Is, am I all in with the Lord and he's number one in my life? And that's hard, man. Isn't that hard to really honestly think through? We, we used to have this phrase playing football and it was uh, the eye in the sky doesn't lie. And the eye in the sky was a camera, a video camera, that would record all practices and games. So in the middle of a game, if the coach was like, dude, why did you do that? And you could lie to the coach if you wanted to. But after the game, guess what? The eye, come on, the eye in the sky doesn't lie. And you couldn't run from that. And God spoke to me, he's like, hey, you wanna check out your priorities? Check out your calendar. You wanna see your priorities financially? The I in the bank account doesn't lie. Get online and just look through it. I, I always encourage people to look at, connect your money to mint.com or every dollar. Two great apps, the I in the sky doesn't lie because you can see all the income that God blesses you with and you can see all the outflow and it actually categorizes it. You can categorize all your money. And then you do a monthly report, you're like, oh, snap. Who comes first? What comes first in your life? One of the things that was really cool with my mom 
in that season, she had a choice just like this widow. And I thank God for a mom who's like, I don't have two nickels to rub together, but God is coming first. And even as much as I hated her dragging me to church every Sunday, looking back, thank God. She put God first. She, she'd make nothing and she'd scratch up that first 10% and give it back to God in faith. And I'm standing on the shoulders of my parents because of their example in my life. Is anybody grateful for that, by the way, of your parents leading the way? <laughs> That's so crazy. Matthew 6.33 is such a powerful passage. Jesus addresses this whole idea of, of priority. And there were people that were talking about, man, they're worrying. Anybody worrying in this season? And the worry was, like, what, what, should, what am I gonna wear? Like, how am I gonna pay the mortgage? Like, what am I gonna eat? And, and there was all these people worried. And, and Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, one of my favorite verses, he said, but seek what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added to you. What is that? It's a shift. So here's the practicality. Who do you pay first when you get a paycheck? Your mortgage company? <laughs> Starbucks? Who do, who do I pay? Who, what it is, it's a matter of priority. He says, you could be tripping about all these other things, but you put God first, something changes. I got challenged by a pastor probably 25 years ago on this. And I thought what many of you are thinking of right now, oh, the church is out just for my money and this big, paid for the big building and pastor's new shoes, you know. It's like, I ain't paying anything, right? So I was thinking that and he, he was given this message. And I happened to be in this season of my life where I was playing pro football for the Dolphins. It was my childhood dream and I actually was making money. I went from spam and macaroni to actually making some decent money. Now, it wasn't, comparatively, it wasn't all that big. I had this guy, my, my locker mate next, next to me. He was one of the best players in the NFL. And one day he goes, he goes hey, you want to see my paycheck? It's like, who does that, dude? Like, <laughs> I'm a peon rookie. What are you doing here? He's like, let's compare our paychecks. I was like, oh. So I took mine out, and I thought, I was like, yeah, dude, I'm loaded. $11,000 for two weeks of work? Yeah. And he, he took out his, and he's like, it was 250 grand. It's like, oh. <laughs> it was so interesting because God's speaking this message of the first fruits, the first 10% of the income. And I'm like, I ain't, give, I ain't giving that. No way. That's way too much money. And God says, no, man, test, I'm going to test you right here. What do, you really, what do you really trust in? Do you trust in your own abilities or do you trust in me? And that was 25 years ago. And so at the church, they had this thing called auto pay. It was like all new. Now, now everybody has auto pay. I'm like, I'm putting that thing on auto pay and let's just see what happens. And can I just tell you, for 25 years, I'm just telling you this to be honest, all I've done is just taking God at his word. Putting him first in your finances and see what happens. Verse, uh, or excuse me, Proverbs 3 that's so good. Nine and 10 says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the, what does it say? The first fruits of all your increase so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Who do we trust in? So it's a matter of priority. Number two, it's a matter of proportion. Go back to verse 13 and I wanna read this again Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go ahead, do what you just said. Make me a little cake first. There's priority. Then use what's left to prepare a meal for yourself and your son. Make a little cake. I like that because proportion, this is what I love about giving back to God. It's percentage. So you might be um, super poor like the widow or like my mom back in the day. Or you could be like just mega rich. And the beauty is, it's percentages. So if I make $2, I can give back that first and 10%. What am I doing? It's a, it's a priority. It's a proportion of what God's given me. It's a trust test that I step into. Or I could be a multimillionaire, and it's just a portion of that money. It, it's a beautiful way to be able to have the whole church participate in God's work and what he's doing. Malachi 3.10 says very clearly, 
bring all the tithe, that means 10%, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. A lot of people say, well, that's Old Testament. Actually, Jesus in Matthew 23, 23 affirmed the tithe. You can go back for homework and jot that down. There's a lot of people that, that tell me about that. Matthew 23, 23. Why do I like this whole idea of proportion, percentage giving, that every believer is challenged to walk in? Give back to the local church that you get fed, whether it's this place, any other place. Why, why do I, I love it? Because then we can all get involved. Isn't it the worst, by the way, when you go out to dinner and the check comes and they, you're, they're always that one dude that's like, look, oh man, I left my wallet in the car, you know? <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of Christians, oh, I've left my wallet in the car. They'll pay for it. You know, they'll, 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 they'll do the work of God. And I wanna show you some stats. And again, this is not to shame anybody. This is me desiring God's best for your life. God doesn't need your money. The church doesn't need your money. I'm trying to give you stats on what this whole idea is in giving back to God. Look at this. Tithers make up 10 to 25% of a normal congregation. Now, you guys are so generous, it's probably more than that, but this is the average, okay? 5% of the U.S. tithes. Watch, this blew me away. 80% of Americans only giving 2% of their income. 80% of all America. The most blessed country in the world. Christians, watch this, are only giving at 2.5% per capita, while the Great Depression, they gave 3.3%. I was reading that, I was like, there's gotta be an error on that. This is true. This is years of research. And again, this is not to shame you. This is just to be honest. This is to be real. And there's super encouraging twist that I wanna put on this because if every believer just gave just 10%, and, and I know a lot of Christians that go way above and beyond that, but let's just say every Christian, you know, doesn't say the the, the wallet's in the car. Everybody, right, gives back to God. If they gave 10%, watch this, there would be $165 billion that the church could actually then flow through us to be a blessing in the community, in the world. Did you hear that? $165 billion. Now, here's just a couple of things that we could do, right? $25 billion, global, hun glo global hunger, get done, gone. $12 billion, no more illiteracy. 15 billion, water and sanitation, clear that up. And this hit me, look at that, where one billion people on the planet live on less than $1 a day. One billion, we could do all the overseas mission work. <laughs> this is a little trippy out, look at that last one. 100 and 110 billion, oh, that would just be leftover for us to continue to do the work that God's called us to do. Can you imagine if we just did what God asked us to do? I mean, this is, this is mind-boggling what could happen if the church literally just did what he asked us to do, and we all have the choice. And that's the choice that God's given this poor widow at this moment. Trust yourself and live in this place of poverty and just, I, I have no hope, or take a step of faith and, and give to God, what, first, it's a little over cake. Yeah, do what you wanna do, but just give me a little bit first, and then you're gonna see what happens, and number three is the promise. This is so beautiful, watch this. Verse 14, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your container until the time when the Lord sends rain and the crops grow again. You know, can I just tell you, really honest with you, Thank God for my mom who took, she, I just picture her just like this widow. My mom just trusted God through that season until the new season came where God provided in crazy ways for my parents. So she did, as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. There was always enough. This is so crazy because earlier she's like, I don't have, I have only a little. And now she trusts God in this test. And now what does it say? There was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers just as the Lord had promised. Here it is, through Elijah. Powerful. Did you see that? There's so many of us Instead of giving the first and best, 
We wait to see at the end of the month if there's enough left. And if there is, then maybe we'll tip God as opposed to just trusting him to say, God, I don't know how you're gonna do it, but I'm gonna give to you. And somehow, some way, there's never any leftover at the end of the month. And here does the opposite. And this woman, by faith, gives first to God and the oil and the flour continue to roll the entire time. Reminds me of the boy with the loaves and the fish. Remember that? When uh, he just brings a little bit to Jesus and Jesus prays and then distributes it. And then the rest of the people, they left with doggy bags. There were leftovers. (laughs) That's what happens when God touches it. It's beautiful. I wrote my notes, this quote, and this might be a word for someone in here. Simple obedience miraculous provision. There's people here today that this, you're hearing this message for the first time. You're like, dude, that is crazy, but that's what God's word says. I'm a Christian now. I'm surrendering to his best. I believe that and trust that his way works. I'm going all in. There's some Christians in here. You, you started out this way, but for whatever reason, the, the pressure in your life, you started like, ah, I don't know if I can. And now he's bringing you back to this simple obedience and trusting God for crazy provision. He's, he's doing it right now as we speak. There was a, a time in my life we had um, felt called to start this church and we went down to a church in Fort Lauderdale and they graciously put us on staff for a couple years and they said, hey, we'll train you on the job training and then we'll pray for you and kick you out to go back to Omaha. To, you and Denise and the kids can start the church. And when I got down there, they hired me and the executive pastor sat me down and he said, hey, um, I'm trying to set your salary. Can you give me what you were making, what your budget was in Omaha? And so I gave it to him, but I totally forgot that I was staying rent free at my mom's house. <laughs> so I was like, I didn't give him that number. So they, they uh, confirmed my salary, but I was $1,800 short every single month while I was in Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> it's a good, re- good thing we have a good finance team that's way better at budgets than me. Hallelujah. So imagine that, preparing for ministry, $1,800 every single month. Now, what do I do at that point? Do I continue to give or what do I do? I'm like, put that thing on auto pay. Let's go. And I promise you this is what happened. That's why I love this is real life. Every single month, somehow, some way, God provided, almost to the penny. One time, I showed up to my, we had a rented condo in Fort Lauderdale, right by the church, and there was like an envelope taped to like the door with my name spelled wrong with like cold hard, like $2,000 of cold hard cash in the envelope. First of all, what are you doing in Fort Lauderdale, putting in cash out on like a porch area? That's how God does it. I got a call from a, from a dude that heard we were gonna come back and start the church. And this was a very generous man that he's like, man, God spoke to me and I'm gonna put you on auto pay at like 1,500 bucks a month. <laughs> like, what? Hey, eh. like how does that happen? God, put God to the test. Put God to the test. That's actually what Malachi says in Malachi chapter three, verse 10. Remember, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. There may be food. And here's what he says. Try me now in this. Test me now. It's the only place in the Bible. He says, test me now. If I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, there won't be enough room to to receive it. And here's the other promise. You ready for another one? And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he won't be able to come in and mess with your your barns and your vats and all that. What does that mean? He can't mess with your transmission. (laughs) That's what it means. God's like, no, man, I'm gonna put like a holy like boundary around your Yugo and there's no way the enemy can come in and mess with it at all. That's an old school whip, sorry. Mazda, <laughs> Lexus, whatever it is. It's beautiful. One of my friends who is on our finance team, years ago, talk about financial pressure, he had mounting credit card debt, um, all kinds of pressure early on in his career, young family, 
And he's, he's like, man, pastor, can you meet with me? And so this pastor of this other church he was going to, he's like, man, I'm really struggling with some finance, financial strain. And the pastor's like, yeah, come on. So he meets with him. He's like, make sure you bring your budget and all that kind of stuff. And, and <laughs> my man, Mike, he brings all his, his budget and stuff. And, and the pastor's looking at it. He's like, he's looking at all his line items, you know, car payment and food and this and that. And he's like, now, now where's your tithe? And my buddy, Mike, he's like, he's like no, I, I, don't, I can't afford to do that, man. And the pastor t- takes all his finance stuff. He's like, <laughs> moves it back to him. He's like, now, whenever you can take the step of faith to, to give God the first 10%, then call me back. I'll be happy to help you. And my, my homie, Mike's like, what an idiot. I hate, I'm leaving this church. These guys, creeps. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit pings him, ping. Maybe there is something about that whole scripture and God thing. He goes home with his wife and he can tell you the whole story because he literally leads all of our finances. His name's Mike Matlock. And he goes back with Jill and they talk about it and they take this step of faith. And I wish he was here right now and like brag on God of what he's done in and through their life. It would blow you away. What is that? It's faith. It's trust in God's word. It's walking in faith and saying, God, whatever you wanna do. One of my favorite verses, this is a bonus verse. You guys ready for it? Proverbs 11, 24, 25. This is so dope. Listen to what this says. Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. Oh, that's so good. Let me read that again. Did you get that? Proverbs 11. Give freely and become, that doesn't make any sense. Wait, if, if I'm giving, how am I becoming more wealthy? It's just how God does it. Give freely, become more wealthy, be stingy and lose everything. Now watch this, the generous will prosper. Some people recently are saying, well, you're a prosperity gospel guy now. God's best for your life. I'm like, bro, you've missed it. No, man, like I simply want you to experience God's best. It's not health and wealth, name it and claim it. I'm just trying to teach the Bible. What does the Bible say? The generous will, the generous will. (laughs) I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. How many, when you give, isn't that the greatest feeling, by the way? Not just giving to God, but giving to others. I'm I'm just looking at Bob right here. Bob, Bob every now and again, Bob and Kathy, they'll just bring heavenly waffles. Talk about like, like, you know, it's like the ravens dropping, you know, the, the bread. Off. It's like the heavenly waffles from heaven. Sometimes they'll be like, man, just keep up the great work. Here's some heavenly waffles for you. <laughs> Every time, you know, am I right, Bob? Bob and I just embrace, and like we both have smiles on our face. I, because I'm getting heavenly waffles in my stomach. Him, because he's being refreshed, because he's giving. It's just how it happens. I, this recently, and I don't say this to brag because, again, I, I do a lot of dumb stuff, but every now and again, God will get my heart in this area of generosity. And by the way, just put out your hand real quick. Just, like, just, just open it. Just, just open that bad boy. Imagine if you just, wasn't it cool when Mike had that illustration last week? Just let the, let the resource of God flow through you. Recently, I, God blessed me with this amazing opportunity to do a broadcast and after, this guy that I was working with was so on point, God spoke to me and said, just bless him in a crazy way. And so there was this particular device that would help him personally and professionally that was on my heart, and I sent it to him right away. By the way, if you, if you get that from God, just get rid of it right away. Like, write a note, uh, say a thank you, bless someone. And, and uh, he sends me a text later in the week and I, golly, I, I hate even talking about this because I'm losing my reward in heaven. What I'm trying to do is just encourage us to be a generous people is what I'm trying to do. And he writes and he said, in all my years of broadcasting, I've never received something like this. This is the, the most audacious gift I've received. And I'm just, and why am I saying that? Because, listen, so many people look at Christians and they're like, you're stingy and cheap and all that. What if we just change the tide and we walk with who God is, the most generous God? God, God so loved the world that he gave and now we're walking in that and now they're like, dude, what did you just do for me? 
and you go, I don't have money, do you have a smile? Some of y'all got great smiles. <laughs> Homework tomorrow? Find the person you like the least at work and give them a smile. <laughs> Make it authentic, okay? <laughs> the student, the teacher, someone's laughing up there, right? The student you don't like, just give them something. You go, I don't have a whole lot of money. Steal from your mom's wallet. No, I'm just <laughs> 10 bucks and go bless someone. It'll blow, it, it'll bl- the teacher will be like, oh, I, I hate having that kid in class. They just gave me some coffee. Panera sandwich. That cha- did that ch- Let me ask you this. Did that change something real quick? I hate to put you on the spot. Because so many of us, we come into church like they're looking to get something from me. No, man. And even this message, I ain't looking... We're not looking to grab anything from you. What we're trying to do is teach you biblical principles so you can walk in his best for your life. That's that's my sole goal, my sole goal in this. I'm gonna end with a quote and a story, and then I'm gonna let you go. And you're like, thank God. (laughs) Talking about brunch, I'm hungry. Remember, please and thank you, okay? Here's the quote, write it down if, if, if you're a note taker. If you're not a note taker, jot it down anyways. Here it is right, real quick. God's people obeying God's voice will always have their needs met. Watch this. This hit me. Despite the conditions that prevail around them. One of my favorite Bible commentators, I, I read him a lot, William McDonald. Look, he's an old school gangster. So good. Just he, he listen, look at that quote. Let me just read it again. Are you God's people? God's people Obeying God's voice, simple obedience, crazy generosity. Watch this. Simple obedience, obeying God's voice. You'll always have your needs met. Maybe not your greeds, maybe not your wants. You'll have your needs met despite the conditions that prevail around them. Look at the conditions around us right now. Globally, in your personal life, the conditions, you can't control the conditions. What can you control? Your obedience and my obedience. That's what will happen. And the story I'll, I'll land with is this. <laughs> we, um, God asked us to start this church in 2008. And those of you that understand uh, what the economy was doing in 2008, it was actually a, a recession. I, uh, this is true. I, I was so naive and ignorant, I didn't even know we were in an economic recession. That's how lame I am. I don't really have social media, follow the news. You're like, this is my pastor. Don't worry about it. We got a great team around us. Remember, okay. <laughs> And he asked us to come back and start the church in 2008 in the middle of a recession. And he said, go get three jobs, start working, rent out Kiewit Middle School and just start teaching the Bible, watch what I'll do. Good thing I didn't know about the recession because I don't know if I would have done it. But guess what? You take the step of faith, like the widow, and see what God will do. And he began growing the church and then, a handful of years ago, a crazy dude named Scott Hazuka came to me. He's like, hey, we got we to start building that church in Elkhorn. I'm like, dude, there's no way. He's like, we're doing it. I was like, amen. <laughs> <laughs> I love men of faith around me. And we needed to raise $5 million in two years with a small little congregation. And I gave the challenge. And you guys gave to God sacrificially above and beyond 5.2 million in two years. And the only reason some of y'all are sitting here is because of the sacrifice of the saints down your row right now. Where are you at? Priority, proportion, promise. Young people, hear me now. If you get this message now, the 20 grand you're, you're making right now as a college student and you're tithing that 2K, when you start making 200 grand and 2 million a year, it's already in your flow. It's not a, it's not a deal. You, you trust God. In fact, that 10% becomes your, that becomes your bottom. And you grow and here's, God trusts you with more and now you're a conduit of resource to reach many. 
Old people, it's never too late. You've been struggling your whole life financially. Guess what? Today is a new day. No headlocks, opportunity. Amen? Thank you, Lord, for this church. Thank you for your faithfulness, your provision. Unbelievable what you've done. And I pray for all my friends tuning in online, living in extreme poverty. I pray you would just embrace them now. I pray they'd be walking with joy, a smile on their face. And no matter how much you delegate to them, I pray they would trust you with the first fruits. The multi-gazillionaire here, I pray they would just trust you and know that you're the one who has delegated such resource. And all of us in between, we wanna walk in obedience and trust you. No more financial pressure, but your provision. We trust you now. Have your way in Jesus' name. Before I say amen, I wanna just land the plane. Just to, I wanna pray for anybody here. You go, I've never just, I've never made this step of faith to give back to God. And this is my day. I've known about this. And I've, I've stiff-armed God. I've tried to carry this on my own. I, I just, I wanna pray for you now that there just be a release. Some of you that you were down this track for a while and you've just, for whatever reason, got distracted, went away from it. I wanna pray for you as well. So Lord, again, all of us, we pray today would be the day we trust you in a whole new way, just like the widow, and you'll provide all we need. In Jesus' name. There's also some people here that, as we conclude, I just wanna give an opportunity, not just to put God first in your finances, but put, putting God first in your entire life. All in, full surrender. That was my opportunity in 1997. I was just cut by the New York Jets. I had hit a really low point in my life. Began smoking weed, dealing weed. I got a job, as, speaking of a sandwich store, I got a job at a sandwich store. I was on the, on the way to a drug deal and a sandwich delivery. And God just radically changed my life. He came into my car. He's like, Todd, is this what you really want in life? You can continue down that road, but my hands are gonna be off. Incarceration, disease, unplanned pregnancy, or you can just surrender your life to me, go all in, put me first, and watch what I do in your life. It's 1997, folks, the end of that year. A couple weeks later, signed with the New England Patriots, a guy named Kurt Warner, and I went to NFL Europe, room together, he trained me on what it is to be a biblical believer. Talk, I'm gonna talk more about that next week. The power of a mentor. Everything's changed. God's word works, man. And if you need to repent, you need to turn to Christ, today's the day. Let's stand together, and if you don't have to go anywhere, I would, tr I would challenge you as a Christian, just pray for someone in here. Someone in here today needs to just say, no more, man, I'm, I'm following him. I'm done doing my own thing, driving the car of my own life, white knuckling it through, through life. I wanna release, let God drive. Maybe I'll hop in the back and let him do his thing. The Bible says God's perfect, he's holy. All of us have blown it. It's called sin. But God, because he loves us so much, he didn't wanna stay separated from us for all eternity. He left heaven, came down to this planet, lived the perfect life that none of us could. Jesus Christ, 33 years of perfection. They pinned him to that cross. He took the sin of mankind upon himself. They buried him in that tomb. Three days later, he rose from the grave. And now he sends his spirit out throughout the entire world, knocking on the human heart, saying, I've already paid the penalty, come, come to me. I wanna forgive you, I want relationship with you, both now and on into eternity. That's the gospel. And if that's you, you've never asked for forgiveness, you've never committed your life to Christ, you've never surrendered, today's your day. In a minute, the band's gonna play a song. All kinds of Christians in here are gonna be praying for you. We'll give you an opportunity, you come forward right here, right to this front area right here, I'll lead you in a prayer. 
the prayer is, is simple, but it's profound. And when it's genuine, it changes everything. God, <laughs> I'm done living my own life. I surrender. I want to follow you. Forgive me. I want to go to heaven. Do you need assurance of your salvation? Do you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt when you die, you know where you're going? Are you tired of all the pressure to live this life on your own? And you're like, I'm, all, I'm done. I want God's best. This is for you. I was reading in the very next chapter of 1 Kings in chapter 18, and this verse struck me. There was, remember what's happening in the nation of Israel. Many people were turning away from God, following other gods. <laughs> Elijah just confronted him. Here, here's what he said. How much longer will you waver, hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, full surrender. If Baal is God, follow him. And I just wanna challenge someone right now. You're kind of back and forth. You're like, yeah, I'm kind of doing my own thing. <laughs> and you're, what, you're caught on the fence. Let me just say, go all in. Just what Elijah said. If the Lord is God, surrender, follow him, amen? That's the challenge. I've said enough. I'm gonna be quiet and pray. If God is speaking to you anywhere in this auditorium, listening online, this is between you and God, but I wanna facilitate this connection. So church, just begin to pray. Van, go ahead and play. If God's speaking to you, you come, as, as the band plays, you come right here to the front area. If anybody, you go, man, I, I need to be down there. And here, here's what you're thinking though, man, that's gonna be awkward. I don't know, I'm gonna be embarrassed. What are they gonna think? You know what they're gonna think? Praise the Lord, man. <laughs> I'm that exact person only saved by the grace of God. We're not gonna sing any longer. You could be anywhere, nosebleeds, behind the camera. Any of you right now, you say, I need forgiveness. I need a new start. I wanna to surrender today. I wanna to make room for God in my life. I wanna put him first in every area of my life. I don't know how it's gonna go down, but I'm committing my life to Christ today. Anybody in the church. Okay. Well, this, this may be, uh, maybe there's someone online. I wish I could see on the other side and be like, see a hand. But let's just, church, can we just pray by faith and just trust that there's, there's engagement. God's speaking through a camera right now. If you're ready, you can pray this prayer. Say, Lord God, I open up my heart. I invite you inside to be my God, to be my savior, to be my friend. Forgive me of all my sin, wash me clean. I've, di I've decided today in India and in Africa and Iowa in Florida, in DC, in California, in Columbia, decided today to follow you, Jesus, from this day forward, I'm yours, I'm all in. Fill me with your spirit and lead me in a life of love for your glory and to help a ton of people in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you guys.
quicker to kind of land the plane. Uh, and again, no headlocks, but we do wanna make it really simple if you do wanna start giving back to what God's doing here at Love Church. So there'll be some options on the screen behind me. The first, pull out your phone and text any number that you wanna give to 84321. It'll walk you through the process. The other would be, while you're selling your phone, get the Love Church app. If you don't have it yet, download it from the app store. You can give right there or at lovechurch.org slash give. And finally, if you're old school and wanna write a check, we've got boxes outside these doors here. You can drop off any Sunday when you're here. Now, if God was speaking to you in any way and you'd love to get prayer after this, we will have a team down at the, the cross right over here. They'd love to spend time just praying with you. Uh, and if you're joining us online, email online at lovechurch.org and we'd love to pray for you throughout the week. Lastly, it's get in the game month as you're all well aware of right now. Uh, walk out these main doors. And if you have any questions about small groups, serve teams, giving, or love out loud, which City Serve Week is coming up, so you wanna check that out. We've got representatives of those teams out in the lobby. So if you have any questions where to go, find someone with a lanyard on, they'll tell you where to go. We just wanna see you guys plugged in. Like PT said, we had almost 60 people get plugged into small groups last week. We're seeing more this week, so we can't wait to see how everyone else gets in the game this week as well. Um, so I'm gonna dismiss us here, but let's pray first. Lord, we thank you so much for today. And, and we just declare, and we declare that you are Lord and then everything comes from you. We thank you for what you've given us. We ask that this week we'd have new revelation of what you're asking us to put first and how you're calling us to do that. So Lord, we thank you for this day. Uh, in your name we pray, amen. We'll see you guys all next week.